Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Andrew Carr from the Strategic and Defence Study Centre at ANU. I'm joined here by Professor Rob Ason of Victoria University in Wellington. He's written an excellent new book, Headley Bull and the Accommodation of Power. Rob, thank you for joining us. Thanks for the opportunity, Andrew. So what led you to write about Headley Bull? Well, there's a simple answer to that question, which is that my doctoral supervisor, um, uh, Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman, one day suggested it to me as a, a follow-up to the book that I'd done on Thomas Schelling, who was a contemporary of, of, um, of Hedley Bull, and that is one of the reasons I did become interested in, in, in Hedley Bull's work, because I see them both as, as theorists of informal cooperation, cooperation without necessarily laws, treaties, formal government. But there are, I guess, a more complex answer to that question is that is that um, uh, is that I thought that that um, I, I, when I came to to ANU as a master's student in 1988, um, uh, Hedley at that stage had, had been dead for for three years um, at that stage, um, at that time, um, his his influence was very very palpable. And I don't think it's possible to go through ANU, whether you're a strategic studies student or an international relations student, without without um, having that having that sense. Um, and I, but I also felt as as I came back to the ANU and worked in strategic studies that his work on strategic studies had perhaps not been given as much attention as it might have. And I wanted to to, to look at that. Um, and as I went in 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 through that, I also found that. Um, a, a, a single comprehensive book on on Headley really hadn't been written. There'd been attempts to do and and successful attempts to do um, collected essays and to, to look at particular aspects of work of his work, for example, on international society um, uh, that Andrew Harrell from Oxford was involved in. Um, but I didn't feel that there was a there was a single story of of Headley. And I think also because he's such an interesting person, it's 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 the work itself is is very very good to read. Um, I don't think it's dated that much. Um, and the early stuff which I wanted to look at is, is particularly useful to read. But I also felt that there was a person there, so I wanted to, to, to weave together the story of, of Headley the person with, with Headley the scholar and hopefully, and hopefully communicate a, a sense of how those, those, thing, those thing, things related. Uh, and also I wanted to, um, to have a nice volume on the CV, as, as <laughs> most. so hopefully this is, this, is, this, is, this is that. Yeah, definitely. So you start in telling that story with a bit of a focus of Headley's time at University of Sydney. Mm -hmm. How important was his study of philosophy and the training at that university to his later kind of worldview? Well, I, I think um, the influence of John Anderson on, on Headley Bull has, has already been uh, um, recognised. For example, Rene Jeffries' um, um, work, work on that. Um, and I think people are aware of this towering figure of Anderson who, who really um, perhaps subdued <laughs> some of his students into, into taking us, or inspired at least, a, a, a similar approach. The commitment that, um, to, to, to basically not accepting anything for, for, uh, on the surface, but digging deep, questioning a critical spirit. I think, I think that had, had an influence on, on Headley very significantly. And even as he goes to Oxford and, and, and does his um, uh, BPhil in those days, that was a, a, a degree that you would do um, after, you, after your, uh, your honours. Um, uh, that that Headley still speaks in his in his letters back to his his fiance um, uh, um, Mary Ball, um, who 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 continues to to live in Oxford. Um, it's clear that he he's he's trying to to bring some of Anderson to those debates. The need to kind of you know go under the surface and, and question dogma. But it, but as time goes on, that 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 wears off a little. I think in philosophy is yes, that the 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 commitment to to to, to to thinking about ideas and thinking systematically about ideas and concepts, that goes through in Headley as well. Um, although one thing that um, Adam Roberts, who knew Headley very well, he, um, he, he was a colleague of Headley's at, at Oxford, he said, I hope one of the conclusions of your book is, is not that it was all about philosophy. And I don't think it is all about philosophy. I think um, I think people can get a bit stuck on epistemology, ontology, all of that sort of thing. I, I think I think it was part of it. Uh, I, I think, um, but I think in a sense, and I think, um, uh, I, I think it, so. I think it tra transcends it, but but it is it is it is part of who Headley is. Similarly, his his studies at his, of history at, at at Sydney are part of who he is. But his interest in political affairs, the the political drivers of things, I think, is something that sort of emerged as as, as part of who he was and, and and his his own interests. One of the themes that resonates throughout the book um, is that Headley never seems to consider any issues fixed or completed. That everything needed to be debated and argued. How important was that process of debate and 
um, he's often kind of movement towards extreme positions at times to to encourage mm. uh, clearer thinking. I mean, I think it's fundamental. I mean, I I think one of the most interesting things about reading Hedley Bull's work, in a you know particularly a, a broad range of his work. Uh, it exposes the fact that he's having these constant internal debates with himself that he never really fully finishes. And in a way, he, he may has, have an obligation not to finish them, to continue to, to, to look for, the, for those opposing views and to fight, try to find some way of, of, of dealing with that. Um, that so that one of his, his early headmasters, this is before he went to Sydney, said he perhaps spends a little bit too much time on on the dialectic, and and so there's clearly that he was a, he was a he was you know he was a he was a debater as as a, as a student, um, and and a, and a formidable debater both in, in text and in person, uh, and and one of the things he, he I, I, one of the things I came across in Oxford when I was doing the the research on on the Headley Bull papers the main papers that are there um, in in the Bodleian Library um, on the back of some of his lecture notes that he had. Um, um, that he had, he, had, he had written were some were some notes that he had done on um, he had taken old responses to mock exam papers that he had, he had marked and then and then put his lecture notes on the other side and the mock exam papers said things like um, to, to a number of students this is this is pretty good but you you fail to understand the other side of the argument and he said that a number of times and I think in a sense that was he felt that was the obligation of scholars never to never debates were never finished so the notion that he was and he ended up somewhere himself in that middle ground but that was not kind of a, a wet, soft, warm mid middle ground of kind of of um, of not really having a view. It was the it was the result of this contest, and and I think so that that meant that he sought out those extreme positions. He found them useful. So there were people that he read that he didn't necessarily agree with, but he felt that they were an intrinsic. Uh, uh, um, part of the debate, and if he continued to attack you, it was actually at times a sign of of, of his respect for the for, for the importance of the position you held, even if he fundamentally disagreed with the position that you did hold. He seemed a, a very lively figure um, throughout the text, and that's one of the the joys of reading your book. Perhaps the central argument you seem to make is that. In understanding Headley, we've looked too much at his latter work on international society and not enough on his strategic studies work, nuclear arms control. Why might that um, kind of difference in interest have, have appeared and, and what does that mean for our understanding of Headley's work? Yeah, I mean, I did start out, in a sense, writing a book about Headley Bull as the strategic studies person. As I did that, I became it became clear that that was much more closely connected to his other work than I had even anticipated. So for example, the work that, and I think one of the reasons that it's not given the, the attention it, it deserves is simply because it was his early work. Um, it was the work that, you know, and when, and when, when Headley passed away, he was um, at the age of 52, a professor of, Montague Burton, a professor of international um, uh, um, relations at Oxford. He was writing on issues about third world justice, uh, third world issues, justice, human rights, uh, international law at times, but he was also at times all, you know, reflecting back on his work on arms control, and it's really his work on arms control where he made his name, and it was the arms control, the control of the nuclear arms race, the, the book that he wrote, the, con the, um, the control of the arms race, I think is, is his best book. I may be in a minority on that, but I think it's a, a very, a very st a particularly strong volume, and, and, and I think what you see in, in, the, in the early stuff on, on, on the control of, of the nuclear arms race as he, as he went to the US, absorbed the thinking there and then came back and translated it and, 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 and revised it for, for a British audience in that book. You see what I, I call the first example of his, of his argument about accommodation. That the book is called Headley Bull and the Accommodation of Power. My basic thesis is that, is that for, I think it's widely recognised that for Headley Bull, or, he did a lot of work on order in, 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 in international relations, and international society was the was the was the was the prism or the main the main flowering of that order. Um, what I as I as I read the strategic studies stuff, it became and the arms control stuff, and of course he also was a, was an official for the for the British government, which a number of people um, uh, uh, don't pay much attention to in the, in the late sixties before he came here to Canberra to take up his first chair in international relations, and in that when he's writing about the Russians and the Americans and the, and and the the quest for order there, he's re he's really saying that that. Um, uh, the Americans and the Russians need to accommodate each other, but particularly the America as the existing power and the Soviet Union as the rising power, they need to 
accommodate one another through informal understandings um, so that so that um, they, they make room for one another they have a series of they reflect the common interests they have in the avoidance of disaster by by these these understandings not formal treaties which can reflect the the, the big agreement but the big agreements happen underneath the big agreements are these are these informal understandings the 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 and, and as as Thomas Schelling would say the tacit agreements which is one of the reasons that that Ball was attracted to, to Schelling um, uh, although when he was writing in, in the in the in the Foreign Office um, Ball actually used that formulation and some one of the officials wrote back and said it's a nice paper but we had no idea what he meant by tacit agreements so sometimes sometimes the sort of the scholar and the official but but it's an interesting so I think that strategic study stuff to me is part a big part of the explanation of, of Bull's approach to international society. In fact, I don't think you can understand his work on international society without appreciating the importance of that of that nuclear stuff. Similarly, the expansion of the nuclear club, the accommodation of China and France and, and Britain by Russia and America, that expansion um, was was essential to order. So Bull recognised that you couldn't turn the clock back uh, on that sort of proliferation, but you tried to stop it to perhaps um, uh, non-great powers. Um, but that, in a sense, is predates the to, to some extent uh, the work on the expansion of the international society, which which was which um, was one of the last main books he wrote. So I see a real connection. So I think, as I say, to understand Hedley Bull as a scholar, even if you see him as a scholar of international relations theory, which of course he was, um, you need to also understand him as a as a as a as someone who, as a close student of strategic studies, because strategic studies, and particularly uh, the nuclear arms race, provided him with some of his main early models. Of and most important models, in some ways most complete models of the of the accommodation of power, of the role of the debate and in ideas in providing a way to to accommodate the 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 the, the competition for material power that was occurring. How does some of these ideas about the accommodation of power and his early study on arms control mm. and, and very hard military issues? Mm lead to the man who's then spent a lot of his time looking at um, human rights, justice, international law. How can we connect those two streams of his research? It's, it's a good question and I think the fact that he did that la later, some of that later writing um, would, means, that, means that I think people do perhaps see Bull as, as, as quite an emancipatory or progressive sort of thinker but when you look at his stuff on, 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 on arms control he can come across as quite biting and, and, and conservative. He's that fantastic mix that I think makes it so interesting to read. Um, I think what really happened um, was that um, one, of the, one of the keys that happened there were actually was the, was the time he spent here in Australia. He came, when he came to ANU, um, he was he was called Wilson's man because in one Canberra Times article because he was working for the Wilson government, and he was also uh, the 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 early um, press release for his position here. It said something like you know he's um, he, he's got a particular um, interest in strategic studies and work in the, work with the, work with the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. He was of course appointed to the the Department of International Relations, um, and then and then I think what, uh, someone it might have been Bruce Miller uh, added the point and and a bit of internet and, and international relations theory as well. But when he came to Australia in particular, he was concerned that Australia, in, a com in, in dealing with the changing distribution of power in Asia, um, the, 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 the decline of complete, almost complete decline of Britain, Britain's, Britain's strategic power in Asia, the, the, what he saw as a, as a phenomenal drop off of American commitment after Vietnam, which actually he exaggerated um, to, some, to some degree, the rise of China, the role of Japan, but also the, the, impo the importance of the third world. He felt Australia in particular was exposed more than almost any other Western country to the, to the third world in its own neighbourhood. And one of the, one of the ways of, of dealing with that, of accommodating the, the, the third world was actually to, to pay more attention to issues of justice, to issues of, uh, of, 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 of human rights. Not necessarily because these were intrinsically right things. Bull was a, 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 a major opponent of natural law. But because these represented the basis of world opinion, in which the third world countries had had quite had acquired quite a bit of influence um, in the United Nations and other places, that it was absolutely important for Australia to have some way of 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 of, of, of accommodating its its neighbourhood, and and that and that was part of it. So so a commitment to justice became a necessary part of, of of a commitment to order. But there are times when those two things kind of 
you know, start to so so Bull's work on justice versus order and international relations is is a sign of that. And there were times when he pushed it so that he thought, well, maybe maybe justice now is more important than order. But I'm never sure he quite got there. You know, if he did, it was very very temporarily. Um, the 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 grumpy Headley usually trumps the the kind of the the progressive Headley. He felt that at, at a certain point that there needed to be this this broader world society uh, uh, where cosmopolitan standards applied and he wanted what he wanted to do was to have some modern version of the of the common culture and civilization that had bound the european world order together in earlier centuries to apply to the new world order um, and that required some sort of set of standards and values and what he thought would would provide that was actually um, some, some cosmopolitan ideas, including about modernity. And so he saw that as a recipe for, but, but part of that was dealing with the, with, with the inequities between the first and the third world. So, so it was, I think, it was also driven by his experience in India. He went to India in the, in the, in the, in the late 60s, um, um, uh, and then he also went there in, in, the, in the 70s on sabbatical. And I think, I think his sense of, and injustice, the way that India was sort of being excluded, and including on nuclear issues, that India, because he went there soon after India had exploded its, 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 its peaceful nuclear explosion in 1974, and he said, you know, it just seems to be quite wrong for there to be an, a, right, a, an assumption that, that India should be left out of this, of, this, of this system, that India actually should be accommodated. And so there's a justice element to that, to that, to that as well. Yeah, reading through the book, I was often um, almost quite sad that we've been robbed of his insights into the current order, that mm, mm. so much of it seems so contemporary and so relevant and, um, and yeah, just a very kind of striking that from such a distance he could foresee some of these issues. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I never, never, never met Hedy Bull, and, and, um, but I've talked in the, in the writing of the book to a lot of people who, 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 who of course, knew him, were his students, um, uh, were his contemporaries as scholars. Um, and and I've, I've I also um, I had many conversations with with, with Mary Ball, who, who, whose support for this work has been has been immensely um, valuable. And you talk to people like Des Ball and and, and Bob O'Neill and others, and you just get the sense of this incredibly vibrant person that you really do want to meet. Um, um, and I guess I've 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 tried to to meet the the the, the Headley as much as I can on 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 on. on in, 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 the, in, in the writings that he left, both published and unpublished. But I think particularly in terms of, when, when you look at this time when he was here, he was here in Australia when the, when he f when the distribution of power was shifting and we, where, where one, at one point, he, a number of places actually talks about the need for Australia to rely less on uh, its alliance with the US as its singular source of, of, of great power security and more to rely upon a quadrilateral equilibrium between America and Russia and China and Japan. Um, and he was in a sense a little bit premature in that, partly because as he realised before too long, America had not dropped away quite so much after Vietnam. China had not really risen uh, um, um, uh, economically in the way that it, that it might. Japan was, in, in, in Headley's terms, Japan could not really be a great power uh, because to be a great power in the modern world, you needed to have nuclear weapons. That was pretty much it, and was one of the reasons that, uh, that Britain still held on to some of the vestiges of its great power status. Um, but that notion of the accommodation of, 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 of Australia uh, relying upon that quadrilateral equilibrium, and, 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 and he had different views on the concept of, of, of powers, but he did at times advocate uh, a, a concept of power in, in, in Asia. It's, it's extraordinarily... Um, worthwhile reading for for um, uh, for people who are thinking about order in in Asia today, and that's I think why people like Hugh White enjoy reading Headley stuff from that period. But that that stuff's you know 1968, 1969, 1971. It's it's over it's over four decades old. So yeah, there, I think that I, I'm 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 st I'm struck by that by that by that as well. Um, that's not to say that everything's sort of finished and up to date, and there are some attitudes that I think you know that in 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 in, in Headley's view of the world that are that, that that do that do date him. And and there's a certain um, you know at one point he he um, for example uh, his, his quest for debate was such that um, 
there was an Oxford Union debate about uh, the virtues of colonialism, or actually that this house opposes colonialism, and of course Headley took, <laughs> <laughs> took, the, took the, the alternative position and said actually if it wasn't for colonialism, Oxford would be the sleepy little place in this, you know, mm. um, and, and, and Ox it was, it's colonialism that made Oxford the place it is today. Now I would love to have been sitting there yeah, hearing he, you know watching the, the the responses to that but I'm sure by then people knew that that, that was the sort of thing that Headley, Headley might do you have a great line in the book where you say that he loves to throw bricks at orthodox thinking and it seems not just intellectually but also as, as a kind of personality type mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm, a bit of mm -hmm, an outsider mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you have a favourite Headley story from all your time looking at his material? Well, that was a question I used to ask the people I was interviewing. I used to say, "Is there a favourite Headley story that you that you have?" And I mean, there are there's 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 quite a range. And so I hope you don't mind me recording some of them. Please. One one is um, one is just Sir Michael Howard's delight. I had a fantastic. Um, uh, chance to interview Sir Michael Howard. He's got this fantastic library in his in his, his house, and and we sat there, and he and I could just see him as he was talking about. It. He said it was great to see in the control of the arms race, and and Headley was precocious, and the early he was a ter terror early on, and he would just take on these these you know these 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 folks from from Britain much older than himself, and and Michael Howard said it was delight a delight to see um, him. Um, slaughter the sacred cows and serve up the cuts. That that was a great you know, that line. Bob O'Neill um, uh, said that uh, after the India his trip to India in the seventy four, Headley returned to Canberra with a great determination to bring Indian scholars to ANU to show how important India was. And one of these scholars gave a, a seminar not far from where we're sitting here today. I think in the Coombs building uh, about Nehru. And at the end of it, uh, apparently Headley said um, well thank you very much for that until you until you until at hearing you I'd forgotten what a what a pompous windbag Nero really was <laughs> yeah that's 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 a, 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 an, a, another one um, I think I think the um, uh, I, I mean I, you know there, there, there are there are a lot of um, um, you know yeah, and, and perhaps more moving Headley stories. But one, and, but one of the funnier ones, I think, is where he's he's at, in Oxford. He this is before he gets the Montague Burton chair. He goes to All Souls for a visiting um, professorship, and and he he's 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 he, he writes a poem, uh, a sort of a funny poem that he sends back to his research assistant in, in, here at here at ANU. And it says he was sort of having a you know basically he was um, a, a, um, seeing some of the the. The, the pretty girls that uh, um, on on the on the high street. He was reminded of, of compare. He was making these comparisons with Cambridge. He's got nothing on on Martin on, on Martin Indyk and 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 Des Ball in, in high heeled shoes. And he sent <laughs> this poem back. And a little later, his research assistant Elaine Mitchell, who I interviewed in London, um, I found the stuff in the in the Bodleian where where or, or somewhere else. I'm not quite sure where where. Um, she'd she'd written to a to a, a retailer in in in, um, in London in Savile Row, basically saying obviously she'd written a letter saying have you got a a, a, a male sh a, a tie that says male you know male chauvinist M MCP on it for male chauvinist pig and there's a lovely delightful letter back saying I'm sorry ma'am we don't have quite that but we do have one with a naked lady on that would that be okay and there's a kind of a but there's a but the interesting thing about that whole comparison between um, Britain and and Australia was it just reflected this tug that Headley felt as an Australian, but as a British Australian because he gave up his Australian citizenship to become an, a British official. And one one of his very last um, pieces of writing, which I think Bruce Miller said he wrote part of this when he was when he was um, sick in his hospital bed, um, he said, and this was a this was a contribution to a book on 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 Australia and British relations. And Headley said it's fantastic that Australia doesn't have the inferiority complex that it once had. And he went to Oxford in the in the you know early fifties, and he 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 recalls to to Mary in his letters saying you know what a um, that, that that how rude the 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 British were to the Australians and how the other Australians like Bob Hawke. Um, uh, and uh, and others, you know, kind of gathered together with some of the other Antipodeans, and and what a bunch of bastards the the, the, the British could could be. He changed his views, I think, on that, um, and his views on, on on Oxford. But but in that last one of those last pieces, he says, he says, so he says, it's fantastic that Australia 
doesn't have this inferiority complex about Britain that it once does. But it, he says, but of course, and this is the typical, I think, Headley, but of course Australia does have quite a bit to be inferior about. And I think that <laughs> kind of, you know, that sort of, you know, that that to me is the delightful example of mm. the type of the type of logic that 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 there's more to that. So even in the humour, there's a there's a pretty sharp point, and I think that that makes it um, makes it great to great to to have had the chance to read so much of his work. You quote a lecture that he gave in mm. the 1980s, and mm -hmm. in some ways it shows not just that uh, that tug he feel sometimes seems to feel between his academic role and and the official role or that public intellectual mm -hmm. role. Mm -hmm. And if I can just quote yeah, a yeah, few sure, of these, because sure, 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 they just sure. had me in stitches. Sure, sure. So he describes some of the international relations theorists as area specialists who say who were the I was there types, the um, saints and men of peace, the wistful fanciers. Uh, the defence experts who study the questions thrown up by government, um, who have um, and study means not ends, political economists who have a habit of avoiding the fundamentals, and my favourite, which was the behavioralists, who he says they are wrong, but that is not the point. How did Headley view the role of academics in society, and and view those academics around him? It's a really important question. That last point, for example, about beha behaviourists, what he's really saying is that actually they are, they're not, they're, they're wrong, but they're, ne they're, they're necessary. In other words, um, the, 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 the sort of the, the, the aura of quantification, the, the false precision of, of that style of thinking doesn't detract from the fact that the American social scientific thinkers um, gave rigour to to uh, the analysis of international relations that was lacking in, in a British tradition, which he sometimes felt was floppy and lazy and, and rather in, insular, inward looking. The Americans had the social scientists. He also said that American so soldiers, officers often, he said they, there are many of them who, who suffer from monumental boneheadedness, but there are among them people who have mastered the social scientists, social sciences. And then you have the British, um, uh, the Brit British soldiers who, uh, British officers who, who sit around and drinking Madeira in the morning at their staff colleges. There's that kind of, you know, so he's constantly, what he's trying to do is, is to say that, that um, I fundamentally disagree with some of the conclusions and some of the methodology, but there needs to be that fresh that that American perspective brings, and that was his one way of. And in that same in that same talk, he's, he says, "Yes, there's a British school of, of you know, which we which now scholars now call the English School of International Relations." But he says it's actually repetitive. Um, it's 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 um, he identifies himself with it to to, to some degree, um, uh, uh, but it it's not as fresh. It's not as it, it it needs to be opened up. And so when he was in the British Committee on the Theory of International. Um, um, politics, a famous group of scholars who would get together, um, uh, um, uh, Martin White and others, um, Herbert Butterfield, um, some of these great scholars. Um, Hedley, Hedley, had, Hedley had Tom Schelling come and address them. He, 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 he gave talks on Karl Deutsch and, and Morton Kaplan, the types of work, social scientific work, that a lot of British scholars were just, just, not, just not, not, not proper. And I think he was constantly trying to, to change that. So the, the job of scholars was to, was to really, I think, um, to bring things into the debate and the argument to really unsettle uh, received opinion, to question everything, to find in statements of... of, of, of of universal position, for example, governments who would claim that they are in favour of, of of complete disarmament, to show that oftentimes those those claims were made to make sure that 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 grandiose proposal failed, and therefore you could you could actually blame the other person. Um, so it was to kind of get rid of dogma, to get rid of he was very he was he was he was he was not in favour of of religious um, uh, views of the world, to get rid of myth and that sort of thing to. Re to, in a sense, replace it with, with some sort of um, uh, more scientific approach, even though he was, he was resistant to that approach at times too. So he, mm. he, but I think also um, uh, scholars also, um, he had this interesting um, inconsistency, um, tension between whether scholars, what scholars' relationship to, to officials ought to be. He was an official himself at one point. He had his own accommodation with power, you know. Um, uh, he, 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 he wrote, when he was here at ANU, he wrote memos that would be then 
um, you know, on Australia's strategic policy and what it should do and why it should it should maintain certain weapon systems and why Indonesia was a worry and these sorts of things. Um, um, so he he engaged the policy community, but he also he also told people don't get too close. You know, um, academics are academics. Po uh, uh, Policy people and politicians, in particular, are different. They're different places. Don't don't confuse one with another. But similarly, he told people, you know, don't do media stuff. That's not the job of that's not the job of academics. But if you look back into his earlier career, he did a lot of media stuff, a lot of BBC. So so he, I think he 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 was he was he was tempted by the things that he felt the need to resist. And so I think always scholars should be should not be comfortable people for anybody to be around, including themselves. So they should actually be pushing each other, pushing each other very hard. And you see that in his early comments on his students' work, um, uh, um, on, on the PhD work of Des Ball and John Vincent. John, Vincent, um, um, John Vincent's wife, Angela, said when, when John Vincent first got his first notes from, back from Headley on his first draft, where Headley's first comment was, this is awful, and then he says, it is awful because, and the usual Headley one, two, three type of thing, he, he made lists a lot. He would start articles with lists saying there's five ways of defining this, one, two, three, four, five. He even wrote official papers like that where he would define something. It was, it was quite incredible. But, but that, that he's constantly trying to push, push, and he would therefore be, I think, if you, one of the things that um, Michael Howard said in his reference, my favourite reference of, of Headley's um, by, by someone else, for his job here at, at ANU, um, uh, Michael Howard says, Headley Bull does not suffer fools gladly, and I've never, never, never come across anybody whose, whose definition of fool is so Catholic. And so I think... Headley's trying mm. to, you know, but that could also give the, 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 him the reputation for actually being, you know, being rather arrogant too. And I should imagine at times, particularly in his young, in, when he was young, he would have been at times, I think, probably very hard to have around. Given these such diverse streams of intellectual engagement, uh, you know, very prolific in mm. his writings, the various mm. areas he mm. researched, is it that attitude of trying to unsettle orthodox thinking that should be how we remember Headley? I think that's an important ingredient into, as part of the method. But I think there's an aim there. And that aim is about order. The need for, for, for patterns of purposeful behaviour. Where, where you have a group of actors who restrain themselves out of common interest and who develop common values, common institutions to, 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 to house those things. And so I think, and I think, you know, one of the things that sometimes worries me about um, uh, views of international politics is there tends to be an, a strong, very strong emphasis on formal structure. You know, the, 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 probably the best recent example of this is the debate about Asia's security architecture. Organisations do not provide the answer. Um, Headley once wrote that he wa didn't want to write about the United Nations because it didn't really interest him. And his, his mentor at LSE, Martin White, said that, the, the, you know, felt that institutions were things like, as, as Headley himself wrote, balance of power, even war, diplomacy. Those were the true institutions. They were the practices. It's that informal approach to order, um, which I think for me is the thing that I, uh, that, that I, that I think is most, is, mo is most, is most valuable. Um, but it's also in some ways a, a, um, it's 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 the way you handle change, but by doing so in a way that that tries to find patterns. So there is a conservatism there as well, and I think therefore I'm I'm I, I sometimes am slightly perplexed by the way that Headley seems to be connected, at times by m contemporary scholars to views that that I'm not sure are completely consistent with 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 at least a, a good deal of the things that he he wrote. It seems to me that people like to take their favourite bit of Headley and extrapolate it. Whereas actually, if the one thing the reading of reading of all the material showed me is that if, as soon as you think you've got Headley, he escapes at the other hmm. end. I think if, if there were 99 people in a room arguing A, he would always argue B. That seemed to be the way he he he, he dealt with it, to the point where he actually at times would would if you if you put them together would would, would be virtually contradicting himself. But that was the, that was the nature of the debate. Certainly, I think a, a very big call for us all to to engage with this amazing international relations scholar. So the book is Headley Bull and the Accommodation of Power by Professor Rob Basin. Rob, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Andrew.